Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education regular meeting for Wednesday, February 12th, 2020. Has this meeting been properly noticed? Yes, it has. Please call the roll. Carlin? Here. Evans? Here. Garner? Here. Herzog? Here. Olmstead? Here. Heschel? Salaji? Here. We have a quorum. Wonderful. Uh, tonight we are privileged to have two students from Merrill Middle School, both eighth graders, Evan Brandel and Alicia Tlatelpa, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'll invite them to come forward and get us started. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We are so glad that Evan and Alicia were able to join us here tonight because we always like to have students at our guard meetings and uh, we haven't had much representation lately from the middle school so it's a pleasure to have you two take time out of your evening schedules and bring parents along to, to join us tonight. So we thank your parents for being here and we thank you for being here as well. We have a signed certificate and a tangible remembrance of your being here and leading us in the pledge. So thank you Alicia and thank you Evan. Thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to stay, but if you have other uh, yes. activities tonight, <laughs> we, we certainly, we certainly <laughs> understand. All right, we will move on to uh, board and administrative reports, starting with the board president report. Um, I can tell you that it's been a busy busy time since we last met. Um, as a result of my serving on this board, I was nominated by both our board vice president and our superintendent to serve on the Wisconsin Association of School Boards Board of Directors. And I was elected last um, fall to the position of second vice president. And the Wisconsin Association of School Boards, which represents all 420 plus school boards in the state of Wisconsin, sends a contingent to Washington, D.C. every year to interact with our lawmakers and make them aware of things that we need on a local level. So it was truly an honor to represent you as well as this part of the state in Washington. We had an opportunity to interact with several of our lawmakers, including Representative Glenn Grothman, along with Senator uh, Tammy Baldwin and Senator Ron Johnson. Um, the two things we were asking for was increased funding for special education, increased reimbursement, uh, to try to get closer to the 40% level of reimbursement that Congress had uh, indicated that they were willing to go to some years ago, whereas right now that reimbursement is around 14%. The other area that we talked about was increasing the number of young people choosing education as a profession. Uh, we know that in this state in the 2018-19 school year there were approximately 2,000 teachers uh, for which uh, they had to apply for special licenses because they did not have the appropriate license to teach in the area where they uh, were assigned. Um, the projection is by 2025, there will, they, this country will be short 100,000 teachers. And so it's really important that we grow our own, that we encourage young people, uh, such as our two student representatives <laughs> and the others they represent, to consider education as a career, and that we have quality teachers moving forward uh, in all of our schools. I also attended the uh, several events at West High last week. That was, that was so awesome because it started with a soup supper in the, in the O Room, uh, which was quite fun. The culinary arts kids were very involved with that and I, I believe some of those students will have a career in marketing because they were very good at convincing me to try the various soups that they, they had that night. Uh, following, but there was also entertainment with that. Uh, I was involved in some uh, entertainment by a musician as well as someone doing a dramatic uh, presentation. That then led to watching both the North and West Boys and Girls Varsity Basketball games and that was enhanced by, by the dance teams of both schools which were really outstanding and the West High twirl team. So it was quite an evening of athletics and food and um, the arts entertainment. Um, I just want to also put in a plug for um, tomorrow night at North High School. They will be sponsoring their fifth annual spaghetti dinner with the Mid-Morning Kiwanis Club. 
and uh, I'm sure our students are going to be talking about that, so I don't want to take away their thunder, but I would encourage any and all of you to, to participate in that event. It's a fundraiser for an international organization that helps children who have been injured in war. And last Friday, I was in Madison for uh, the Professional Standards Council. Uh, again, as a result of serving on this board, I was nominated to serve on a committee with the Department of Public Instruction to advise the state superintendent on issues related to teacher licensing. Uh, we talked about a variety of topics there, including, again, how do we recruit more people into the profession and how do we retain them. Uh, we're losing far too many teachers after year two, year five, year ten who are choosing to go into other professions. Um, and one of the things we talked about was improving working conditions uh, for the, the teachers. And we also talked about uh, the EdTPA, which is an assessment which currently all pre-service teachers, that is teachers in, or uh, students in college, have to submit to and there's some talk about changing that because the research does not support a good score on the ed TPA and the education uh, or the effect teacher effectiveness uh, programs that our teachers um, <coughs> experience once they're hired so those were just some of the things that I've been involved in and I um, appreciate your support on that I wanted to um, bring back something for each of you from my my trip to Washington DC and I, I tried to tie a couple things together our our board policies address the fact that we are a continuous improvement district which means that sometimes we don't always get things right the first time but we have to adjust or correct them plus many of you serve as chairs of committees and you have to call committees to order. So oh, she, she yeah. I found these. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I found these um, so awesome. mini gavels, <laughs> pencils with dual erasers. I guess we get two. For those of you who make mistakes. <laughs> oh, thank, you. thank you, Barb. There are some oh. Barb. <laughs> right? yes. Thank you. Future speaker of the house. <laughs> the colors. Right. And because of the colors, I needed to get you two. So it's to not show any Diplomatic. Bias. <laughs> there anyone who did that? So, so now you have your own individual gavel or your own individual means of correcting mistakes and continuing our efforts in the continuous improvement realm. So with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Cartwright. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Herzog. So tonight we're going to go ahead and we have our two student representatives available on here present with us tonight. We're so glad to have both of you back. Welcome. And we're going to start right away with Oshkosh West High School with Amelia. Okay, so February has been a pretty busy month for Oshkosh West. We're going to start off with athletics as always. The bowling team won conference. They're the conference champions so that's very exciting and we have quite a large bowling team and it's very big in our school and the boys wrestling finished fifth at the conference with Alec Hunter getting first um, and he claimed his second FVA title and then um, eight other West students finished in the top ten uh, boys basketball won against North at the in the doubleheader. It was in a very exciting game, and they won 63 to 55. Uh, girls basketball had their senior night last night, and that was very widely uh, advertised since there was um, lots of events happening there. Um, and it was the last game for many of our girls on the team. The Ice Hawks had um, a game on Thursday, February 6th, and they won against Shano team. And their score was 7-3, to three, so they were getting up there. Boys Swimming had conference this past Saturday, and they placed fourth as a team. And Sam Blaskowski, he's a junior at West, he placed second in the 50 free. And that's very impressive since there is a lot of very good boys. 
Gymnastics got sixth place at the Whitefish Bay Bradley invite this past Saturday, and they're continuing to have competitions throughout this month. I just want to give a thanks to uh, fans team since they are very, um, they get the student body going, and we had a lot of students at the game last Friday, and that was all because of them and their their advertising on social media. Very exciting time for many of the senior senior athletes. As this past week, Christian Sheik signed um, his letter of in intent to play baseball at Upper Iowa, and Colin Jones also signed to play football at Upper Iowa. Dance team went to state this past month, so they they got third at sectionals, the competition before state, and so they went to state. And Jessa Nemeth was an individual who actually got D1 all state for um, the first time in West dance history. She's going to be the only dancer that has had that, and they're wanting to continue that tradition to have more dancers next year. And they did very well. Again, um, Mock Child went to state, so lots of people going to state. Mm -hmm. And in these next few weeks, they're going to continue trying to improve their performance before the big competition. For music, uh, there was a band concert on February 6th, and um, it was all of the bands, so half the um, music department was there. And musical, the musical Sister Act happened from January 23rd to the 26th. And actually, there was a lot of school shows that happened before that, too, during the week. And you could tell many of the kids really enjoyed it, especially when the two main characters kissed. They went wild over that. Um, and in the choir department, contemporary a cappella groups are currently being created. And this is different from the past since there has only been vocal jazz groups. Last week we had Snow Blast. And this is a week of fun where the fans group, um, they put together these a competition between uh, all grade levels where you make a team of 10 people and you compete for points and doing silly activities and then whoever wins gets t-shirts and gets the title of winning snow blast so Monday we had the waistline challenge the height challenge and the basketball challenge Tuesday we had the log saw snow bowling and log toss Wednesday, we had tug of war and pyramid build. Thursday, we had gang sport and boardwalk. And Friday, we had make your own sled and sled down garbage hill, which is very exciting. Here's some more pictures. People get very competitive, and a group of seniors actually won this year. Another event that happened was superbly won. So it was an event trying to get um, showcase all of West's talents, and it was actually before the doubleheader um, basketball game. So we served soup and grilled cheese, and we showed the artwork and um, actually had people play music and perform. So we wanted to get the community into involved, and it turned out pretty well, and we want to increase the number of people next year as they want to have this event annually. Student government hosted a blood drive on January 31st and this was a pretty big blood drive since we had 115 blood donors. We collected 72 good units of blood which is also a pretty large number since a lot of students are have, are in sports right now and they can't donate blood, so that was a pretty impressive number of um, blood donate donors um, for that, for what is happening right now. And we're having another blood drive on April 7th. 
So we hope you have a great month, and we'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you. you. What a wonderful report, and we're so proud again to have you here and to provide us with all of that wonderful information. And now we're going to transition over to Oshkosh North High School with Cabal. All right, so there's a lot that's been happening, and there's more to come in February, but there's only so much that I can share when stuff hasn't happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> so for um, February so far and for the past events, we had a Super Bowl just a couple Fridays ago, and we raised over $900, and that goes towards the Ann Davy Fund at North. And if you guys don't um, know what that is or aren't familiar, it basically is an um, a organization that helps purchase items for those students at North that aren't um, able to purchase them for themselves. And that could be like bus passes, um, like backpacks, duffel bags, and things like that. Um, but it was very successful since this was the first time we did a soup competition because the past years it's been chilly. Um, so we were pretty proud of what happened. And then just recently we had our Valentine's dance for our students with special needs and um, students from middle, school, from middle schools and high schools participated in this and it was a really great outcome as usual. And for sports, um, our dance team got 10th place at state with their hip hop routine. And that's the best that our dance team has ever done in school history, so that's super awesome. Um, for Boys Swim, they got third at the FVA meet, and they will be competing in sectionals soon. Um, wrestling got seventh place in the FVA conference, and they have regionals this Saturday. Uh, basketball is going well for both boys and girls. Girls are still looking for their first win of the season, but they are all still looking forward to the last couple of games. Hockey is also doing pretty well, and they are, um, are starting regional play on the 18th, which is just next week. And bowling for boys are going to state. They did pretty awesome, and they are doing really well, so we are really proud of them this year. And Dr. Herzog mentioned about the spaghetti dinner a little bit, but um, the Communities One students are partnering with Mid Morning Kiwanis and Inara this year to host a spaghetti dinner to help um, fund for NARA to support those students who have been affected by war, whether that be that they're refugees or they have injuries. Um, but please come and support. It's tomorrow, 5 to 7. It's for a good cause. And even if you don't want to save for the food, I mean, just buying a ticket would help them as well. And last but not least, I mentioned this at the last time I was here, but Lay Miz is going to be performing this week. So if you guys do go to the spaghetti dinner, you can go to the play, uh, to me, go right after. Um, the tickets are, like, I think sold out for Saturday. So if you still want to look for tickets, um, good luck. But it's going to be really good this year. And that is all so far for this month. See you guys later in March. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another excellent example of our students providing information for all of us and does such a remarkable job representing your school. Thank you both so much. Well Dr. Cartwright, the superintendent's good news report and the calendar. <laughs> so over at South Park Middle School recently held their first semester of Panther Pride Night, providing the opportunity to show off student work and involve families in fun activities. Additionally, 50 students in the school's art department recently traveled to the John Michael Kohler Art Center. Students and staff participated in a make and take workshop and toured the current exhibits on display. Oshkosh Early Learning 4K classrooms at Davis Child Care Center recently received a visit from the communities at Oshkosh North students. The high school students engaged in learning with their 4K friends. This ongoing partnership provides a leadership opportunity for the high school students and a role model buddy for our district's youngest learners. Community two students at Oshkosh North recently hosted the Ann Davy Super Bowl, just as we heard about just a moment ago. Nearly 100 staff members attended and raised nearly $1,000 for the Ann Davy Fund, which benefits students in need at Oshkosh North. <coughs> The Oshkosh West Athletic Department recently recognized the 2019 Athletic Wall of Fame Award winners. The purpose of the award is to recognize and honor outstanding achievements by individuals in athletics who contributed to the promotion and growth of athletics at Oshkosh High School or Oshkosh West High School. Congratulations to this year's award recipients. 
three Carl Traeger Middle School students recently placed in the Scripps Regional Spelling Bee at Horace Mann High School in North Fond du Lac. Additionally, one of the students will be advancing to the state competition in Madison on March 7th. Great job, everyone. Carl Traeger Elementary School joined the Global School Play Day movement for a full day of play on February the 6th. Students were engaged in unstructured play throughout the day. Each year, schools from around the world stand together to say, unstructured play is a vital part of proper child development. Shapiro STEM Academy second graders recently expanded their learning about India by video conferencing with someone who once lived there. Students learned about the Ganges River in India and how much it is being polluted. In their next engineering project, they will be following the engineering design process to create a water filter to clean polluted water. During these lessons, students will be researching different ways to help stop water, land, and air pollution. Oakwood Elementary School is celebrating with pie. The school is busy getting ready for a visit from the award-winning author Sarah Weeks. In fact, the entire school is reading her book, Pie, with their family each, work, each week. Families are sharing what they think about the book, and students are answering trivia questions about the book and listening to guest readers in the Media Center to get caught up on their reading. Emmeline Cook, fourth and fifth graders, had a blast at Dr. Eric's Skate Club. Most of the students have participated in a field trip to the skate club at least once a year for the last three years. Some many more times than that with their participation in the lighted schoolhouse. Thank you to Dr. Eric for continuing this tradition for our students year after year. As superintendent, I remain committed to being present and engaged in our schools and throughout our throughout our community. As you can see on the screen, there's just a few examples of where I've been spending my time. I'll point out one of the um, activities was um, actually a, a trip with the American Education Research Association. Uh, this would be in our governance meeting, and I'm very happy and grateful that I was able to get to Florida and actually make it back from Florida, <laughs> given all the complicating well, weather factors to that. So, uh, but again, being out in their schools, seeing many of our students in actions and our, our teachers and what they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis is truly the heart of a lot of my time and my visits and I'm very gracious for those opportunities. With that, I will turn this back over um, to Dr. Herzog. Thank you, Dr. Cartwright. Uh, next, we have District Administrator Supplemental Reports. Do you have any of those this evening? No, ma'am. All right. Then we will go on to uh, Board Committee Chair Reports. And I know Mrs. Olmsted is eager to uh, share. <laughs> so we'll start with that. It's a short one. Um, on Monday, this last Monday, we met for Policy and Governance Committee. Um, the, we only had one thing on the agenda, and it was policy 7440, facility security. Um, Mr. Jones informed the committee about necessary updates to the policy due to the changes with the door security system starting in mid-March. The new system, Raptor, will require every person visiting the school to swipe their ID prior to entering the building at the main entrance. Students arriving after the school day begins will be required to scan their ID as well. The system is linked to a national database that will do a background check on the visitor and alert the school if there's any issues. The system takes a photo and prints an ID for the visitor if the background check is clean. Staff will be trained on the system in early March. Communication will be sent via media blasts and then the information will be included in school newsletters in advance of the implementation. The decision was made to start this program now versus the beginning of the school year so that added security is in place, so that are all acclimated to the change sooner rather than later, and so that it is not another new item at the beginning of another school year. Um, so this will be coming back to us to um, vote on this agenda or vote on this security facility security policy 
And when it does, um, when we come back, I think at that time when it's finalized, we were going to ask um, Mr. Jones to come up and, and talk about it, just to tell what it is and explain a little bit more of the system, which is really, really, really cool system. So we're really excited about it. Mm -hmm. So that'll be at our next meeting. Um, and then our future meeting will be March 9th at 8.30 a.m. That's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharpstead. Does anyone else have a board committee? Yes, I do. As promised at our last uh, board meeting, I'm going to give the legislative committee meeting notes that met on Tuesday, January 28th. Um, we had a special guest join us. It was um, Representative and Minority Leader Gordon Hens, and the bulk of the meeting was basically a conversation with him, um, getting his perspective on what has happened in Madison the last uh, term and what might happen in the future. He said currently they have the fewest number of days that are being spent on legislation and the fewest number of bills are being signed. The legislator is scheduled to meet three to four more times, then they will be off until January of 2021. Um, he talked about, uh, if you've been following the news, you found, heard that they found some reserve money at the state level and they were just trying to decide what to do with it. And Governor Evers, Evers has uh, asked for a special legislative session to deal with education uses for that money. But I found out today that they did their gaveling in and gaveling out. So they didn't even discuss anything. Um, we discussed uh, various viewpoints on proposed legislative items. The committee made suggestions on possible changes. For instance, uh, providing a separate line on the tax bill listing the cost of voucher schools to private school and private schools allowing for more public awareness. Um, and then once uh, Gordon left, I gave a very brief legislative update and a report on our uh, state education convention in, that was held in Milwaukee. And our next meeting is going to be on February 25th at 8.30 in the morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Evans. Does anyone else have a board committee report tonight? All right, seeing none, um, we move on to the non-agenda related public forum. There was no one who signed up for that. Next agenda item is the agenda related public forum. No one signed up for that. So we move on to workshops. The Facility Advisory Committee consolidation recommendations with Dr. Gunlock and others. team we've got here. That's great. Well, I'm not coming up here alone. <laughs> 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 As you wish, Dr. <laughs> uh, this is uh, a culmination of, mm. of quite a bit of work over the span of probably about six months. It really started uh, six to eight months ago. Uh, in fact, it actually started in 2017, mm. but the lion's share of the work uh, was done by the Facility Advisory Committee. Um, uh, Clint Selly from Bray Architects, Jim Fox, and their teams have done a lot to put a lot of information together for us. Uh, and really what the focal point of this presentation is, after the board decided to not proceed with the previous April referendum, it was really coming back. The next step was to talk about the consolidation plan. What kept coming up over and over again was the idea of Oshkosh really wants a plan. Mm -hmm. and and what does it look like at the end and then we backwards plan to today and that's this is the start of that conversation um, starting with the history in the background and I think I'll turn that over to Clint to talk a little bit about uh, the 2017 uh, analysis study so um, thank you yeah and again we um, we went through all of the buildings uh, with a number of different lenses um, looking at the uh, mechanicals of the buildings uh, looking at the conditions, so uh, how's the flooring look, the ceiling, um, all of those types of things. Um, we've um, we've looked, uh, at, we've touched on historical significance again. Whether um, that's something we talked a lot about with the committee, of you know what what's the community's perception of the building every 
community kind of sees their schools and, and, and age and historical significance of the buildings a little bit differently. Um, so we've had a lot of discussions about that. Um, construction type, I think that's a, that's a really important one here. Again, some of the older buildings that we have are, are built really well. Um, but that has challenges when you're when you're going to go in and fix things, um, you know, piping and some of the mechanicals are um, sometimes not very accessible. Uh, sometimes where the load bearing walls exist uh, makes it challenging. Um, so again, a number of different things that we've looked at um, through a many many lenses, um, considering the district um, and, and and where to go. Um, one more uh, site challenges is, is another one we, we have within the district. Um, some schools like Traeger have a lot of land uh, available to them. Uh, others such as uh, Washington um, are on a very, very, very small site which makes again expansion or um, dealing with some of the challenges difficult. Uh, again, a, another question um, or some ideas uh, that we talked about specifically <coughs> with the committee is uh, when do you know when to um, walk away from the building? And again, that's a, a question that every uh, client deals with uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, we talked through this, uh, this was a slide from one of our community uh, presentations. Um, there's kind of a, 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 it's like a 60 to 65 percent sort of rule of thumb when the cost of um, renovating and remodeling an existing building approaches um, uh, the, the about 60 to 65 percent of the cost of a new building. Um, sometimes that's a pretty good indicator of, of, of maybe when it's time to, to go away. Again, there's all of those things on, on the previous one, again, significance and all those things that, that can swing things one way or the other. Um, but this is, has been something uh, in the industry that that's, has been used uh, to, to help justify it in some instances. Uh, again, we've, we have updated this uh, to kind of reflect where we sit currently with, uh, with a number of things. So this was a chart that was provided uh, within the community survey that went out that kind of distilled everything down. We had a bigger, a little bit bigger document that uh, had a little bit more detail. Uh, again, the student enrollment is um, per uh, some information Dave gave, gave me from the, would it be the third Friday numbers? Mm -hmm. or, um, third Friday in January. Uh, so those have been updated and then our column um, with the cost to uh, upgrade and improve safety security building systems um, that was also updated and I'll kind of speak to that a little bit at the time of the survey I believe that number was right around 127 million um, going through the committee process as we looked at the uh, safety security portion of that we were really kind of challenged to find uh, means and methods to um, to, to to more cost effectively look at that. So we went through a several different rounds of, of um, looking at the plans for the safety security. Do, did they all require additions? So you'll, you'll notice kind of the, the change to the 116 there is really because we took a lot of some of the additions that we were originally planning out and tried to be a little bit more cautious with how we were approaching uh, the, the usage of that. So that kind of speaks to that slide. So the Facility Advisory Committee, uh, and, and you've heard this because I've given you the facility updates, so this is really probably more for people watching, but the Facility Advisory Committee used the following cr uh, criteria. Uh, their, their task was to propose options, renovations, and upgrades that support learning environments that are safe, accessible, efficient, and equitable, um, purposeful spaces that inspire innovative learning, uh, accommodate evolving technology, promote collaboration among students, staff, parents, and the community, and lastly, a solution that maximizes use, reuse, and or replacement of existing facilities that is cost effective for the taxpayer, providing for an enduring end product that is energy efficient and adaptable for decades to come. And if, if uh, history is any uh, you know, guide to us, those decades to come could be 10 decades to come uh, as we use our facilities. Uh, this is just a listing of the meetings and what was discussed at each. Obviously our facility advisory website has the video from meetings two through six as well as all the presentations from meetings one through six and all the associated materials. Everything on here is there including the executive summary. If you wanted to grab one document and look at everything this would be that document to look at what did the facility advisory committee say. So this was a slide from the last presentation. This is sort of the recap. 
Um, what the Facility Advisory Committee said was commit to long-term consolidation efforts, adopt a long-term pathway, and they would recommend pathway B, which we're gonna go over this evening, and that would move us from 20 facili facilities down to 14. Pursue a capital referendum, and number four was engage the community further regarding proposed phase one middle school and elementary school. Go ahead. Uh, board, if you will check your email very quickly, you will have access to the updated version of this right now, so that way you can follow along with us. Uh, if, so if we can pause just a moment sure so can. they can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Thank you. We were looking. And we're on slide 10. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm good. The information is it's just in a different order. Got it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, okay. it was still all there. In the yes. Still, yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you. You're quite welcome. We just want to make sure that you can follow along with our presentation. So when you look at these recommendations, they were broken apart into main <laughs> recommendations and additional recommendations. And uh, what you'll notice is, there we go. Um, three and four we've kind of merged together because given the direction of the board from the last meeting, um, mind you, the facility advisory committee was still thinking that we were going to bust apart phase one. Um, so really what we're doing is we're stitching that back together. That's really the, the, the effect of that action. Um, the additional recommendations use key criteria for school site adequacy for our assessments. That seemed to be very logical. Uh, number two, we always do this anyways, but provide taxpayer impact charts for informational materials. And number three, include yes. playground equipment within project scope. I was at uh, um, Merrill Elementary, Merrill Middle, Webster Elementary, Webster Middle, speaking to each group today, uh, as well as Roosevelt, I talked to a team there. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing was when I was speaking with Webster Elementary and they were talking about the potential idea of getting a new elementary, guess what the first thing they asked was? Does that mean we're going to get a playground? And I said, well, one of the recommendations that I have gone on record and said is my personal favorite, uh, probably it's also the cheapest one, is uh, include <laughs> playground equipment within project scope. And I said, I, I, I really think that's something that uh, whose time has come, and that's certainly one of the recommendations. Absolutely. So they, that, that, that drew a cheer amongst the crowd, just so, yeah. so it's a crowd pleaser. You would surprise. think it would be a no brainer. Yeah. Right, like Lakeside when we did the addition. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, yeah. A lot of districts, I mean, the districts I've worked in, that always seems to be the thing at the end, and it always seemed kind of silly to me that we would go ahead and build a brand new school, and no. then you'd right. wait two to three years for the PTO to get enough money to right. get a playground in place. And then the PTO buys whatever they want. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, looking forward to that. So, uh, one of the things we wanted to talk about, and we did change the order, this is the order change we was when we talk a little bit about bo benefits of modern facilities. You know, we've been talking efficiency, three to four track, eight to 10 track. From a staffing perspective, that, that is a, a very logical benefit. But there's also a lot of other instructional benefits. There's also some aesthetic benefits, and there's also some uh, uh, learning benefits to having a modern facility in terms of flexibility. So I'll turn that over to Clint, because sure. he has some pictures of, of what some of these facilities could look like. Sure, and um, so yeah, so tonight I, I kind of talked to Dave, I said there's sort of two different methods, I can maybe show fewer pictures and talk a lot, or uh, sort of a sensory overload and show a whole bunch of pictures. Um, and much like picking your favorite <coughs> child, uh, I, I, I um, <laughs> probably went a little overboard. So I'm, uh, while there's a ton of slides here, I'm gonna go, uh, try to go extremely quickly through them. I'm, I'm glad you guys have the presentation. You can kind of view this um, uh, at your leisure. Um, again, learning environments, there's a lot of study, there's a lot of development. I would say schools have changed quite a bit even within the last uh, five to 10 years. Um, and uh, again, uh, Comfort, confidence, creativity. We are we are building schools as as student student centered spaces. We are we are really thinking about what is best for the students. Um, 
Dave also kind of said, you know, well, what, what does a modern facility mean? And I think one of the key words up there is flexibility. I mean, that is so important. And uh, a lot of times when you talk about, you know, modern schools, um, you, you talk about, uh, you know, flexibility. And then, and then at some point somebody says, well, you're talking about an open concept school. And, and then that, that makes people nervous because obviously those had their day and they had some challenges. But the, 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 you sort of almost start with the principles of that, but you have the ability to you know, compartmentalize and you can go from big to small. So um, that's kind of that, that part, part there. And then again, supporting students and educators who benefit from visual cues, ownership, pride, and opportunity for independence and collaboration. And I would say next to the word flexibility, then the word collaboration is kind of the other really important thing of modern learning, that we are giving these kids an opportunity to work in small groups, work in big groups, uh, work independently, and, and um, giving them the spaces they need. The other thing is he goes through these, what I would, what I would ask you to think about is think of the modern workspaces yeah. that adults are in today. I think you're going to find they look more like this. Mm -hmm. um, we don't just build a school and then ask the teachers uh, to live in, and work in it. Um, architecture doesn't shape what, how we're teaching. We really need to listen to how you want to teach and then make the architecture respond to that. Um, and, and again, there has to be an implementation as well in, in terms of then when you build it, they, it has to be used and functioned um, as, as intended as well. Um, again, a lot of different things to think about. Evaluation, understanding, we've kind of been in the existing conditions part of, of this uh, little chart up here. Facilities assessment, kind of understanding use. Um, again, you'll see delivery of curriculum is really important and I think as, as we set off down this next path, it's really important that not only what is our path, but you know what do we want to achieve and, and how do we want uh, students to learn and teachers to teach in these buildings. So again, real quickly, um, these, those first set of slides will be kind of collaborative learning uh, spaces. I'll just flip through them uh, really quick. If there's, if there's one in particular that you uh, want, want a little more elaboration, I'd be happy to share. Just real quick story here. Um, hallways um, have always kind of been where we've sent kids for taking tests and things like that. Um, giving some opportunity that those can be environments where students purposefully can learn. There's access to windows and they can be seen and there's furniture to support how they they learn. Uh, again, another example of a hallway as a learning environment. Um, the openness between the spaces. I think, um, didn't Oakland have some of these types of doors or am I? Yeah, similar. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, furniture is so important. This is a great example of kind of that professional environment and professional look and feel. But that's one thing you're going to see as we go through these slides is how furniture has really uh, come to support a lot of these spaces. Mm -hmm. This is an existing school where we just added a skylight to get mm -hmm. natural light to rooms that do mm -hmm. not have it. It's an interesting because I've toured this school uh, four or five times since it's been completed. Every single time there's students out in that space utilizing that hallway. Um, great space. And I think it's really important also to highlight just a little bit that we know that there's a lot of research out there that's related to ha the ability to have natural lights mm -hmm. and students um, mm -hmm. where they are for their mental health as well. Yep, great point. Mm -hmm. Yep, it helps reduce tardiness, it helps to uh, the, the wellness and, and sicknesses. Um, this is a great example. We created a collaborative space um, in a new building, so this was a new building. And then when it got time to remodel an existing building, they wanted a similar space. So again, making sure that there's equity between when we are uh, have the ability to, to build new versus when we are, are left in an existing space. Again, I talked a little bit about scale. So this is just a little alcove. Again, some students like a bigger space. Some kids like to you know t curl up with a book in a corner and 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 utilize that space. Oh, that's my favorite. Yeah, that's my favorite too. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this was a, a classroom that we removed to create, again, within an existing building to create a collaborative uh, learning environment. Uh, this is your neighbor to the, the south, North Fond du Lac. A great story here is we went through a whole branding effort. The, the elementary school is, uh, they kind of refer to it as lands of learning. So each grade level is known by a continent versus a grade level. 
Uh, libraries, again, um, forever have been the hub of, of schools, but you know, again, um, how we're treating them, how we're um, utilizing them, the, the books, while still important, aren't always the most important thing with, within the libraries and where we do have books. A lot of times they're on wheels and they're able to be moved around and, and the whole look and feel of, of the space is able to be changed, uh, at, hopefully at a moment's notice. Uh, and, and again, creating uh, different spaces within the library too, a little couple little collaboration <coughs> areas or, or nooks. Uh, again, this is a great, great example of the flexibility. Oops, what did I do oh, there? No. Oh boy. Now we got to start all over. <laughs> I know. So we're starting all over, all today we're going to talk about. <laughs> I think we were on the 40. Slide 39. 39. 39. Yep, uh, again, the flexibility. The uh, yeah. Um, on the right hand side is a corridor. This space is kind of a, a multi-use space. It could, those doors could be open, it could be part of the corridor. Um, the doors could be closed on the right, opened on the left, it's part of the library, or they both are closed and it's a, a professional development space. So we just try to create a lot of different spaces um, um, to, for, for kids to utilize. Uh, STEM STEAM Fab Labs, um, again, this, this is working its way um, through all uh, levels and all grade levels, elementary example, um, where, where that's being, uh, that curriculum is being implemented. Uh, again, visibility, these, the tech ed spaces, STEAM STEM have traditionally been spaces that have been kind of tucked down a dark hallway. I know when I went to high school, I had no idea what was happening down there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you see the cool stuff and you're like, why wasn't I, why wasn't yeah, I in that it class? It was scary down that hallway. <laughs> right. And, and now we want to put these spaces on display. We want to show kids what's happening in there, the you know, robotics, uh, um, the, the CNC machines, the routers, all of that equipment is, is interesting. And, and, and trying to encourage kids to participate. Mm -hmm. um, so these aren't spaces anymore that we want to, to hide away. This example, um, that window you see in the back there is actually out to the cafeteria. So this uh, model was set up as this is the design lab. There's a fabrication lab in the back corner. There's a testing lab back there and then they come back to the drawing table. So that's all on display from the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, where some districts are lucky to have wonderful uh, local partners um, who um, help finance a, a project or finance equipment within the project, let's put it on display. Let's make this noteworthy. Let's make this something that hopefully, again, people are excited about and, and the partners um, have some rec recognition of, of, of their efforts. <coughs> um, nursing is also in the biomedical fields are becoming a, an important part and need to be considered in schools. And then this, this actually kind of reminds me of Oaklawn a bit. I didn't include any Oaklawn pictures. Hopefully you guys are familiar, but that, you know, just the simple idea of having a green screen and how important that is uh, for, um, for those types of activities with uh, the flexibility. Finally, community spaces. Again, our schools are not just schools. They're, they're the lifeblood of our, our neighborhoods and areas and, and communities and want to make them either reflect the community. Again, this idea was the, um, we were emulating a, the town square in East Troy. Um, um, that's a reused uh, gym floor on the steps there. Uh, again, powerful graphics to again convey um, hopefully the, the message of the school. Uh, great cafeteria space again supporting the public areas as well as the school during the day. Cafeterias don't all look like cafeterias anymore. They um, uh, almost kind of resemble, you know, college unions, if you will. Uh, the furniture is, is flexible and, and it can be um, used as in a number of different ways. Uh, this is an example, again, this is the Madison area. This is a walking track that is accessible to the community throughout the day. Um, and then on the weekends and nights during big games, they can pull bleachers out and utilize that for seating. Just one beach. Hey, I have a question, or actually, Dave, do we have this on, can, is this gonna be on the public? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. I just and don't think that, I don't think people understand or even maybe know 
what other schools really look like, what right. other districts, what they really school. have. I was just going to say that. I don't think they have a clue. Like, mm -hmm. I think when your kids get in high school, you know, because you travel a lot with your, if your students are in sports or music or things like that, you travel to other school districts and you see those mm -hmm. things. Right. But if you don't, I mean, these, to look at these pictures, um, the elementary schools, I've never seen any of the pictures of those. I've seen all the high schools because I've been to a lot of them, but the elementary stuff, you know, you don't travel to different elementary schools. Yeah. Right. To see those, it's, it's almost like you're looking at this and honestly, in my head, I'm like, oh, well, that'd be really cool. But these are real schools. Yes. People re really have this. Yeah. In Wisconsin. Like it's a shot like in yes. Wisconsin. Yeah, this is like in Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Just so you know. Yeah. That blows my mind that this is truly what we could like this is this isn't like, oh we can try to design this, it'll be neat. No, this is realistic. In that Wisconsin. people have this. this. There are kids that normal. get this. Mm -hmm. So if someone's moving to the state and they're yeah. going to be working in the valley. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to probably have, uh, drive by schools and they may see schools like the pictures you just saw. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, that is going to impact their decision. On mm -hmm. Because it's a live. better learning environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Not because it's more, I mean, it is prettier. You know, I mean, I love our schools. I love all of them. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, obviously, right. I've stayed and I volunteer for Oshkosh. I'm always here and I've never moved. Mm -hmm. But... You know, I've raised all my kids here. But what I'm saying is, is, is that these environments are better for learning for the, the views exactly. and the natural lighting and the mm -hmm. open concepts for, you know, those space areas and the flex areas and kids. And it's just not only appeasing to the eye, but it's also such a good environment for the children to be mm -hmm. in. Well, no, Mental I, health, all of it. All of, and in addition, we have opportunities because we hear from our local businesses and saying, you know, we, we want students... Uh, we're not we don't have enough individuals who have the right mm -hmm. skills that are necessary to come out of, from high school and to mm -hmm. gain you know we're having to do a lot of training outwards um, so now we have opportunities as we go forward potentially mm -hmm. if we're looking at um, a redesign of our schools or mm -hmm. rebuild of our schools mm -hmm. um, to open up those conversations and partner with some of our local um, industries and mm -hmm. saying just as we saw where they have a whole lab, you know, mm -hmm. like a fab lab, and mm -hmm. it, it is sponsored by uh, um, partnership, partnership businesses, mm -hmm. and the children, the, our students get the training and the skills right. that are necessary, so when they graduate, they're ready. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Or they're ready, or they're more ready to be able to go maybe go to a tech school mm -hmm. and, and get some certifications related mm -hmm. to that, if they didn't get it in high school. Mm -hmm. right. um, so there's just so many different opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I would put what our teachers do up against any school district in the state. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And w in Oaklawn's case, the exterior of the building matches what's occurring on the interior. Mm -hmm. In a lot of our buildings, let's take Merrill as an example, that is not the case. The amazing things that are happening inside of those walls, you ke in, in most cases people looking to live and move and w live in a community might not look or take the time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's partly reality. The other part of it is we're dealing with a 120 year old building that has, you know, uh, millions of dollars of needs that would, and even if we went ahead with that, we'd be doing things like tuck pointing roofs mm -hmm. and putting in elevators. Yeah, While that is, that is certainly, tuck pointing is exciting now that I know what it is. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not something that the building to the naked eye is really going to look any different than it is today, and you're still going to be dealing with a 120-year-old yep. facility. Right. Yep. So therein lies the discussion that the Facility Advisory Committee started having, mm -hmm. and the real question in their mind was, where do we start, where do we get on the merry-go-round here? Do we, mm -hmm. Where in Oshkosh do we begin to address it? And it seemed to make a lot of logical sense to go for Merrill as sort of the beginning moment for this mm -hmm. discussion. Number one, we have small, very small mm -hmm. middle schools. And, and the idea of right-sizing the district would allow us to provide more student supports. At the same time, we'll have to be able to take advantage of greater efficiencies. At the same time, we'll be able to have facilities that look like what you just saw. So that seemed to yep. be a really nice, logical way to begin. Also, as this board has asked numerous times, we want to see the whole plan. Mm -hmm. Don't just start with one school. Show me how this, how every single mm -hmm. school fits into all this. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to share with you next is a detail of pathway, sort of the consolidation plan. It's, it's referred to as pathway B because it was, that, that's what it was designated. And this is a diagram that um, you've seen before. This is our existing schools with existing enrollment. And you can see we have 20 facilities there. Um, 
and we've broken it out a little bit on the west side and north side because we're going to be focusing phase one more on the north side. So here is pathway B and what it would be at the very end of all of the discussions that we're having. And you can see there's a bar across the top that shows phase, uh, phase two, three, one, and four. And we're going to focus on phase one, obviously, because that's where we're going to start. But in a sense, what would happen in phase one is we would have a new Merrill Middle School. And mind you, uh, we're not even sure if that's what it would be called. It's just a new middle school on that site, okay? Um, there would be four elementary schools, Oaklawn, Reed, E. Cook, and a new Webster Elementary School, once again, a new school on that site, and then, of course, existing North High School. So that would be the area covered by phase one. So if you, the next slide actually shows that in a little bit more detail. And obviously, all of these will be available on the website. And this shows pathway B, but it shows phase two. Now, this is on the west side. Uh, in this particular phase two, improving South Park becomes the anchor. Just like improving Merrill becomes the anchor on the north side, improving South Park becomes the anchor on the west side of the district. So there would be uh, five elementary schools, Oakwood, Traeger, Franklin, Jefferson, and Lakeside. There would be two middle schools, Carl Traeger, and the new South Park Middle School, and then obviously West High School. So that would take us down to 14 facilities that would be about the right size for a district of approximately 10,000 kids. Yes? Can you explain to me why Franklin is split between school, two schools? What does that mean? What uh, is that about? It's it's just about how the, how the <clears throat> excuse me how the boundaries will work out and again we I don't think we've fully vetted out how that would look uh -huh. but just in terms of right now um, the schools do kind of feed in there was the possibility there that just Franklin by nature of where it was the fact that it's uh, picking up I believe the a good chunk of the Roosevelt population so there there might be some some split mm -hmm. and and we haven't fully fi fi figured out how that boundary is going to look. Um, so with Lakeside too, they would have some going to Traeger because we still have Green Meadow students getting bused all the way to the south, so that's probably in most there likely too, that right? would involve a boundary redraw. I mean, okay. right now that's something we talked about even before any of this. Right. The fact that Green Meadow drives past Traeger often and goes and to Lakeside. Buses, yeah, yeah. I, I, we probably would clean that up when we do the makes the boundary sense, changes. Yeah. It just makes more sense for. But people. it wouldn't stay that way. So those kids, we would redo that boundary, <laughs> and there would be Traeger kids and Lakeside kids. And then Lakeside kids would go to South Park and Traeger kids would go to Traeger. Mm -hmm. Correct. But this is different. This is Franklin, these kids yes. going to Franklin right. Elementary right. School and then right. in fifth grade splitting. So when we do this, there is going to be an opportunity to redraw boundaries with each phase. And some of the boundaries will be minor, some of them will be a little bit more severe in terms of having to do the redraw. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is phase two of the project. So this is after phase one has already been completed there could be things that would change between phase one and phase two. So there's four phases to the plan. We'll go through all four in just a moment. But everyone is built to stand on its own. And everyone is built to be looked at at the moment we take a look and make adjustments based upon where our population goes. So if all of a sudden population increases, some of the lines may shift. If the population decreases, the same thing might, might occur. So each one has its own flexibility built into it. Now phase three and four is relatively simple. One is the, the replacement of West High, and the other one is the, either the remodeling or replacement of North High. Um, so those are pretty cut and dried. But for phase one and two, they're meant to be flexible. Because even if we, once we're done with phase one, that's the most accurate at the moment, enrollment patterns could shift mm -hmm. in the two years it takes us to construct those facilities. Right. Right. And we have options around if enrollment goes up or down or stays flat. Right. We've, we've taken all of that into account. And at those times, we can relook at you bet. certain things because I, I, I'm <coughs> leery on splitting up a school at fifth grade. I would I recommend, I would strongly recommend you do not draw a boundary until that school is darn until near close dark. to completion. Right, because exactly. Th that Because we want to pull the most accurate data at that moment. Um, okay. And we learned a lot when we redrew the boundaries for Oakland. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Gunlock, can you explain a little bit, because under each school name, 
not only is it list, listing a projected enrollment, but there's some other language up there that our, our community may not understand. Sure, like some of them talk about safety and security, though that might be some, some remodeling changes or just some interior door changes. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is addition and renovation. There may be an addition renovation necessary in that plan. Um, let's see, infrastructure, it just, you know, like Jefferson Elementary School, there may be some infrastructure improvements that need to be made at that site. So there, it just goes through and talks a little bit about, because some sites would Things be wholesale replaced, like mm -hmm. a Merrill Middle School. Right. Uh, some of the sites might just be modified. Okay. So let's take a look at phase one, because that's one that's the most important at this moment. But we wanted to show people that it's part of the bigger whole, and it's part of a coordinated and integrated whole. So in phase one, we would replace Merrill Middle School with a new school of greater capacity to house Webster Middle and Merrill Middle students. Okay, that would be built on the land next to Merrill that's there right now. So it'd be, the, it'd be constructed while we're still running school as normal. Then what we would do is we would move the students into the new site. We would use the old Merrill. The Merrill Elementary kids would still stay there and the Webster Elementary kids would come there. And then what we would do, the plan would be to uh, basically rebuild and replace Webster, the Webster Middle Elementary Complex with a new Webster Elementary School. That's and then all, all it would those be. kids would go back? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. No. So we'd, we'd replace Webster Elementary School with a new school of greater capacity to house Webster and at this all point Washington. So the Webster kids would go back, yes. We'll talk about the Merrill students in a second. And at this point, it's, we would project that we would close Washington. Those students would go to the new Webster okay. facility at that moment. And I'm just going to call it the Webster facility, what it's eventually called. That's for a later day. But it, it would be that new elementary school okay. facility on the current Webster site. So that would close Washington and Merrill Elementary School. So your next question is going to be, where is the Merrill Elementary kids go if we're going to close that down? Mm -hmm. Well, what we would do is those students would be placed at Emline Cook, Reed, Oaklawn, and the new elementary school via boundary change. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to re-boundary. So somebody may say, hey, wait a minute. Why don't we just send all three of them to the new site? Well, if we did that, it would be 700 plus, mm -hmm. closing in on 800 kids. And that would be too big of an elementary school. Question. Yeah. How far away is um, Washington from Webster? They're pretty close. Yeah, they're pretty close. Not yeah. more than a couple miles, right? I don't think so. Yeah. It's, it's so like extraordinary. It's walkable. I think right. it's totally less walkable. than a mile. Yeah, and I'm okay. pointing that out because it's very close, and if we're still going to have neighborhood schools. Right you will definitely have neighborhood schools. What makes sense. Yeah. Yes. If you drove into another community, the neighborhoods are going to be about the same as their elementary schools. The advantage of this is the fact that we are going to be able to more properly staff our classrooms. Okay. We're going to be able to take advantage of, of uh, economies of scale to keep class sizes under control, and we're going to be able to provide additional resources to kids. Mm -hmm. The one thing that continues to grow is our focus on behavioral and mental health and how do we deal with students who have those needs. Um, it is, we're going to be way more effective adding resources for kids along those lines if we have a three to four track school than trying to say we have 191 kids sitting at Washington, we have 200 and some kids sitting over here. How do we split people enough to make that happen? Yes? What's going to happen to the AGR when we close down Washington? Does it transfer like, with kids? It's like you were at Webster this morning or this oh. afternoon with me. That was their question too. They're like, well, what do we do with AGR? I said, well, first off, Washington is AGR and so is Webster L. So they keep. So that they would easily okay. be able to keep that. Good. Um, I don't know if we can transfer the Washington's AGR contract. To somebody else. Yeah, unless maybe, I don't no. think we could sweet talk DPI into doing that. But um, if, if we're consolidating schools together, then they can have AGR. Okay. But we can't just say we're transferring it to another school. Right. So the new larger Webster site school would be AGR. Good. Right. Um, I'd like to comment on number one up there. Um, I have experience working in a larger, it was then a junior high school. We had 1,300 students. It was the only <laughs> middle slash junior high in the community. Um, we did not find that to be too large. We had a principal, two assistant principals, four full-time counselors, a full-time police liaison officer, 
and we pretty much knew the name of every child in the school through what we called care teams. We addressed the needs of students who either moved into the community or had issues in school and then did follow up from week to week. So did we miss some students? We probably did, but we made a concerted effort to make sure that as little of that took place as possible. As I interact with other uh, school board members from across the state through the Wisconsin Association of School Boards, there are a lot of schools throughout the state who have, or school districts, who have middle schools of the sizes we're talking about here. That might be the only middle school they have because their overall numbers are so much smaller than ours. We're typically the 10th or 11th or 12th largest school district in the state. And of the 400 plus school districts in the state of Wisconsin, 300 are described as small or rural. So when I interact with other people, they don't find numbers at the middle school level of 500 to 800 to be unusual. That's right. what their community has supported for years, and it's worked for them. Right. And they have great things going on. So I don't think that number alone is necessarily um, problematic. In fact, I think it's an advantage because we've had situations in our district where we haven't had enough students sign up for a yeah. particular elective, mm -hmm. and so we've had to eliminate electives. So we actually reduced opportunities for children because we can't mm -hmm. offer, say, a German class in this school because only 10 kids signed up. 14 signed up over here and 20 signed up over here, but that's not sufficient to support a staff member um, going right. among and between those schools. So. I think the opportunities would be on the rise rather than on the decline. I, I would concur. I think if you want to limit the amount of supports we put in place for children, you keep doing what we're doing because we have so many small sites, it's just going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for us to do that uh, given the fact we're running 20 facilities at this moment and, and this plan is a way at making them uh, you know, moderate sized. There, there, there are certainly uh, schools around us that are, have them much, much larger and, and are, are very effective, as Dr. Herzog points out. Mm -hmm. um, so in a sense, what this would do is this would take us from five schools down to two in one shot. So because we, we and, and that's explained, we, so Merrill Middle, Merrill L, Webster Middle, Webster L, and Washington would be turned into a new uh, larger elementary, a new larger middle school and uh, that would be phase one. So everybody seems to understand that one. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, questions and a lot of people think this, this does make sense. They also want to see what phase two looks like. So phase two, now mind you, phase two is after phase one is done. It would be sometime down the road. It would most likely require a referendum to do as well, uh, but it would fit with phase one, and here's why. So we would replace a remodel South Park Middle with a new school of greater capacity and we would transfer the Tipler students to either all to South Park or a portion to South Park and a portion to Traeger. So Traeger and South Park would be the two middle schools on the west side of town. Uh, we'd remodel a variety of elementary schools to modernize the learning spaces, similar to the pictures you saw, and handle additional students as needed. And you already saw some of those in terms of the remodeling of different sites to be able to accommodate some more students. Um, we'd repurpose Tipler Middle School and the Shapiro STEM Academy. Now what those could be repurposed for is still open. Um, for Tipler, it would make a great deal of sense to allow us to move the rec department there. Um, the, the rec building is, is probably next on our hit parade of, of most interesting sites. Uh, but it's also something that's probably uh, used up its useful life. You know, as you've heard me say and people in the community have heard me say, um, the one thing Oshkosh really does well is we use our facilities a long time. Nobody s says you guys should use your stuff a lot longer no. because we tend to do that a lot. Um, the rec department is an example of those and that would fit very nicely into the Tipler site. Um, the Shapiro STEM Academy, that's an excellent piece of property uh, and a facility that we could, we could use that for a variety of things. So. That, that would be repurposed potentially. Um, closure of Roosevelt Elementary School would occur and Shapiro STEM Academy would uh, close and Tipler would close as an entity as they exist today and those students would be placed in the facilities that were listed under phase two. Hey Dave, 
Yes. Would then the, the the STEM Academy and like Alps, the programs, would those then just move with the kids? Uh, so ahead. that some of the things that we're working on right now, okay. maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, and that's some of the work that we're doing across the district right now. So, so for example, some of the equity work that we're talking mm -hmm. about right now, mm -hmm. you know, it, what are some of those best practices mm -hmm. um, and having to serve students of all abilities mm -hmm. and levels and what does that potentially look like. So to give a solid answer, it's too premature okay. um, to give that answer to you. Um, related to related to the Alps program um, for Shapiro STEM Academy, that the as that entity itself, the entity would close. Mm, yeah, However, okay. it does not preclude us from looking at um, programming across the district and how we look at that and look at potential charters and ways in which we offer. You've heard me in the past actually call those like um, schools of focus or mm -hmm. magnet programs, yeah. uh, because at this point the world becomes so much different than, than what we are right now because we have the ability to do so much more and offer our students so much more because we're not limited um, because of the size of the facility and having to spread personnel out so sparsely across the entire district. You'd also have the ability to modernize those facilities which will give you a whole different yeah. set of opportunities in how you deliver the curriculum mm -hmm. and that could just open up a ton of possibilities okay. that we don't have right now. So that's phase two. Okay. Obviously we can go back to any of these. Phase three would be the renovation or replacement, replacement of Oshkosh West. I remember John Lemberger when we were looking at the window project actually saying, hey, at what point do we replace stop. West High and stop doing these things? You know, I, I think at this point, phase three, you would be ready to replace a West High. Um, some people have asked, well, what about, you know, on site? What would you do? If you use that existing site, I find it incredible to believe that we would come back and say we would build another California design school. Um, you know, I, I probably recommend you not do that here. Uh, and that means you would probably go two or three stories up, and that means the land that is there for West all of a sudden becomes much more available. Mm -hmm. And there's already infrastructure at that site. So I think there's some great opportunities there for phase three. And phase four would be identically the same thing that would handle uh, North High. So if people want to know what is the plan, that could be the plan. And th that is entirely up to you as, as the board. But it certainly is a viable plan and would, would right-size the district. And at the same time, it would allow us to provide learning experiences for kids mm -hmm. that we cannot provide right now. So the last thing we kind of stop with is, can you imagine a time when all of that is done? Can you imagine what our district would look like when all of that is complete? And when people are driving by Oshkosh and they're able to see schools like Clint showed mm -hmm. um, by the lake. I mean, I'm st I got to tell you, look, I was standing in a classroom at Webster L today looking out at the water and I thought, can you imagine the same kind of windows that are at Oaklawn right now that overlook uh, yeah. the field overlooking the lake like that. I mean, you know, I, I go back to elementary school there. Uh, but, but just the imagining of, of the district where as, as needs pop up, we f we're able to focus our resources effectively and not spread people all over the place. Mm -hmm. I think there's some real benefit to this. Um, and I guess at that point, that's kind of what we're asking people to imagine is, is this is what the future would be. And it would be built for a long time. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. Once these facilities are built, Oshkosh, if history is any indication, are going to use them for another 60 to 100 years. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not like we're not going to use not. these facilities yeah. well. Yeah. So Question. that's the end of my soapbox. I'll get off now. <laughs> that's exciting. That's I share your enthusiasm. It's fantastic. Um, I had a question about Tipler. Somebody asked me, isn't Tipler in better shape than South Park? Oh, but it's a lot smaller, though. But it's a lot, it's yes. a lot smaller. Yeah, and there actually are uh, is a section of South Park when we've talked about that project in particular. There's a section, I believe it's the south side, uh, if I have my directions right, mm -hmm. that is a newer part of the building. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, so when we talk yeah. about uh, you know addition, oh, yeah. renovation, replacement, uh, I think there would be ability uh, the ability to save a good chunk of that property, um, f or, or, or that building, and add on and and, and reuse and, and and then again it's almost similar to what we're proposing at um, Merrill, where we you know 
build and then tear down. You know, we, we sort of make it work on that site. Okay. Um, I believe the overall site is, is also, a, 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 in terms of what the district owns, is a little bit bigger as well. So um, I think positioning, too, uh, again, location, that site, I think, um, centers on a, a, a greater mm -hmm. chunk of people versus Tipler obviously being a little further to the west right. so it, it it helps uh, bridge the gap to the the kids to the east then too that was one of the questions that the FAC talked about they kind of started flipping the Tipler versus South Park idea and that's mm -hmm. where the site adequacy criteria came in mm -hmm. where it was well how would you make that decision and that's where we began to look at the different criteria mm -hmm. and the the the, the land that South Park has was favorable compared to what Tipler right. has. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, quite frankly, when we get to that point, you would almost say, well, what do, do we choose a completely new site, too? I mean, you might, right. again, depending on where the population right. is, right. maybe mm -hmm. something else makes uh, better sense mm -hmm. at that time. I, I think, understand. I'm oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think that's important for people to understand that, that until we start breaking ground, none of this is in, in stone as population changes every one of these phases has the ability to flex mm -hmm. and I think that's important for us because we, we just don't know what the future necessarily will bring mm -hmm. but uh, we have a lot of flexibility built into all four phases and just for clarification also the flex we, there's flexibility not only with uh, what schools or, or what design that kind of stuff, once we get out of phase one, but also the board has the flexibility as to how you put in your zoning mm -hmm. uh, and what that looks like in order to load balance between schools. Yes. Um, and that is, and I want to make sure that people are aware that that's actually a very normal thing for boards to do. Um, if you look at some of our, our school districts around us, for example, Appleton, because they would be comparable in size to Oshkosh, they are looking at their zonings very regularly, and um, yeah, at least on an annual basis. Um, whereas I know we have not necessarily, um, but we haven't had a reason to. And now we're, we're getting to, the, as we proceed forward in our community, um, supports us with this and, and we go forward now we have reason to really start looking at that so even when we're looking at Merrill Elementary School old Merrill Elementary School what does that look like and we gave a few schools as far as the option is concerned it's because where do the students live mm -hmm. and what makes sense it does it make sense to cross over the the current boundary of um, Oak Lawn in order mm -hmm. to get to um, E Cook or to mm -hmm. go go over to the new uh, potential Webster element, you know, whatever that we want to call that site. So these are things where the board has some has ability to navigate mm -hmm. and and to ensure that we do the appropriate load balances, because when as uh, to Dr. Gunlot's credit, as you build a facility, the population shifts. We saw that mm -hmm. occur sure. with Oaklawn and Lakeside. And Lakeside. Lake yeah. Lake yeah. 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 So. What's on us, on us as a, uh, or, or on you as a board is, as we, as we're seeing that, and we have the most recent information before we solidify. You know, this is who's going where. Really take a look at that and make sure it's the right decision for the right children at the right time, um, and and doing that. But it it, does, it will require that that there are going to potentially be some of those boundary changes. Um, we have to. But again, it's to get your optimal use. Um, so that you can provide the optimal services and supports mm -hmm. and an educational environment for our students. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Dr. Gunlock. No, uh, we, we actually have changed our boundaries more than once since Oakland opened. Um, mm -hmm. They've usually been very small changes. I think the one we've talked about was the Lakeside Green Meadow boundary, mm -hmm. starting to look at that, because that would be logical to do. But obviously, if we're looking at this, we want to make sure we're, we're, we're understanding where we're going to be at that point in time. So it's very normal for districts to redraw on a regular basis. Right. With regard to Tipler, my sister was in the first, I think it was the eighth grade class when Tipler opened. And I recall conversation at the time that the hallways were made, I mean, it was all up to code, but they were specially designed narrower, the ceilings were shorter, and the stairwells were pitched differently to, mm -hmm. to preserve space. And so in talking with principals at Tipler over time, they've expressed some concerns about the stairwells because of because of the way they're pitched um, mm -hmm. and students falling or tripping and, and that sort of thing. So um, I don't know that that same issue exists at South Park, but I know that that was the conversation um, about Tipler when my sister was a student there, going back to when she was a student. Mm -hmm. 
She's not a student there now. <laughs> I'll make that perfectly clear. <laughs> so. I, I do want to commend administration and um, the facilities advisory committee because in my history in the district, I don't recall a time when there's been a long range plan of this magnitude uh, to look at facilities in the district. Mm -hmm. And I'm not faulting anyone, I'm just saying that's, that's, that's how it's been. But I think there have been members of this board in more recent years who have encouraged the board to imagine or imagineer or to look at ways to move forward and be more forward thinking about planning for the future. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe we have the administration in place to do that and we also have the wisdom of the Facilities Advisory Committee, which was a fairly diverse group to assist with that. So I just want to thank all of you for the endless yeah. hours yeah. and Clint with, um, yeah. with Bray and Associates who have done so much to get us to this point today. So yes. thank you all. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say thank you again and, and echo what Kelly said about um, high schools in different areas. Clint, did you guys do River Falls by chance? We did not, no. Okay. Well, I was recently, I'm a wrestler and a basketball player, so I spent all weekend in gyms, and I was at River Falls last week, and they have a beautiful facility. And it looks like the ones you showed us with the flexible spaces, and if you're going to spend eight hours at a wrestling match, oh. it's really nice to have that space as opposed to our high school, we don't have anything like that. We mm -hmm. don't even have a gym that we can host a wrestling tournament or a basketball tournament because it's not big enough, right? Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what I've been looking for, some sort of plan that will get us to align our facilities with what is out there because we are um, definitely in need of some new buildings. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I think this is a fantastic approach. The last thing I would say is, is uh, this isn't just about building new facilities. Remember, there's $116 million in need of our old facilities that would largely go away if we started modernizing and replacing them along this path. So that's the other thing that, that I think it's important for people to understand is there is no way out of this spending nothing. Right. You know, we have to either maintain existing or we have to replace and remodel some existing. Um, it, it certainly seems like this is the right time to do the latter. And given the, e the economic outlook breakfast, there was some fascinating information that the Chamber of Commerce shared that the economy of Wisconsin is very strong. Mm -hmm. It's projected to be very strong nationally in, in Wisconsin for the next 10 years. So, you know, when people always say, when is the right time economically, it is a very favorable time. Um, that, that is not always the case when districts have to do these sorts of things. So. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? I, I have a little lot. Go ahead. So no, you go first. Um, I have one comment. On slide five, the building cost benefit analysis study, up on the top it says 2017. Can you, before this goes, or can we edit it if this is on the if on you know on our website and people can go see this can we put someplace that these are updated numbers because everybody that looks at this would think this is 2017 and you said that the dollar amounts and the student enrollment are updated Correct. Mm -hmm. so can we i don't know can we put 2017 but then put some kind of like it updated, updated in 2020 you know mm -hmm. um not completely updated, but some kind of updated, you know, just because if I was to look at this and I think of inflation, I think of everything else, well, I'm gonna add a bunch of money to this. I think it's important to note also I what what it includes versus like what it does not include. Um, yeah, it's so Clint, there, yeah. can you speak towards what those numbers include and what they do not include? Because we had we had a lot of internal discussion about this as well. Yeah, okay. and we, we did have a bit of that. So again, we had a, a little bit bigger document which had a little right. bit more information on it, and there was a couple notes down okay. at the bottom. Again, this is just really fixing what you have. This isn't making spaces bigger. This isn't creating collaboration spaces. This isn't adding classrooms. This is purely fixing you know pipes in the wall and 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 updating flooring and and those types of things as well as um, again within the numbers here 
um, there was some some work for the safety secure uh, uh, vestibules and, and entry um, uh, conditions to be that's created. in these numbers yes mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, the, the, we, we did also, it, we kind of included this one because it's a little bit, it's very clear, it's very legible, it's a, the easy uh, mm -hmm. information, um, but we also do have that updated document right. as yep. well, the, the numbers uh, aligned to that, the enrollments are updated, and then we do have kind of the, the little bit of the language of this is this, it is Can not Can we throw this. that one slide in there and write it after this one maybe, mm -hmm. so that it's all, you know, some people can actually see and have the right information. Like this is included, this is not. Mm -hmm. This is where we're at, this is the enrollment. Yeah, we can mm -hmm. certainly do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank and, you. And just for highlighting purposes, mm -hmm. it, by replacing the five schools that we're, that we're discussing, that takes $24.7 million right off the top. So maybe mm -hmm. put that on there too? <laughs> you know, the more information, because this is, people aren't going to watch this as much as they're just going to go to our website and read through this. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. So the more information, I mean, this is high level because you're here to explain it to us, but for them just to have little things like that, like if we do, you know. And, and we'll do it in, typically in the past we've done it by modifying some slides, which I think your suggestion is great. I think okay. we should do that, but also we end up throwing that into some frequently asked questions. We actually awesome. ask that question. Okay. You know, what is included and isn't included in here? And right. why wouldn't we spend that money? And you know, yep. some you, okay. you go ahead and answer some of those suggestions, but I think Dr. Cartwright's <coughs> point is is the real salient one, the fact that there's there's twenty four million dollars that comes off the books if we replace, if we go from those five facilities to two new ones, yep. right off the top. And you get a new so in a sense, you, you, yeah. you, you fund the elementary school mm -hmm. completely, yep. mm -hmm. just by what you don't have to do. Mm -hmm. That's, That's a good, good talking one. Point. Write that down. I'm right, I am right, I did, I am. I'm like, That's a great talking point. I have another question. This is Salaji, I think you might have been there. Yeah, um, so I was just going to point out that obviously this will cost the community, right? We talked about the referendum. I think the survey said it was about $100 a year on a $100,000 home. But I want to point out that it also will get us money back because like Ms. Carlin was saying, going to those communities where they're able to host big tournaments those things you have to eat while you're there. Some people stay the night. You know, they go yeah. Friday, Saturday night. Everybody stays the night. Yeah. I don't know. I only have elementary kids, yeah. so yeah. I'll get there. I'll get <laughs> so it boosts and then the whole community. Yeah. It, it's a very good point. So we'll mm -hmm. get money back as well. Mm -hmm. And something Dr. Gunlock said is it'll attract people to live here too. Mm -hmm. So I think when we yeah. talk to people about the cost, because I'll admit that $100 um, is feels like a hefty price tag when you're living paycheck to paycheck. But when you think about the boost, it'll be for the whole community, for the jobs, for the people living here. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna, it's gonna pay back. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was those elementary school pictures. Um, seeing the kids reading in the little like cubby spaces yeah. just melted my heart. <laughs> because right? with small children. Um, Did you imagine their faces walking in? Oh right? <sighs> Despite having these big couches and you know beanbag chairs, the things we have at my home, Sometimes my children's favorite place to sit and read a book is the laundry basket. Like yes. that, right? Mm -hmm. Like that. And they're so yeah. cheap. <laughs> we I can know. buy a lot of laundry baskets. <laughs> 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 they're not hard oh. code. Right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, darn it. <laughs> you can't put kids in laundry baskets. <laughs> but um, the last few years, the last two years, I guess I should say, my two elementary students, they are, so this year they're first and third graders, their teachers have used flexible classroom seating. And mm -hmm. I will admit I was skeptical of that at first, like, because I taught middle schoolers and it's hard to maintain kids, so you're going to let these elementary kids have flexible seating? Like, yeah. that was sketchy to me. Um, <laughs> but it's so successful, and so when I see those elementary school classrooms that are actually designed to allow that, mm -hmm. it's really exciting to me, someone who was a skeptic, um, because what my kids' teachers are doing now is they're making flexible seating in a classroom that was built in 1950 that was designed for rows of desks, and they're changing that and making it flexible seating. And I just think it would be wonderful to give our teachers buildings mm -hmm. that are designed for the way kids learn now and the way that we should be teaching them now. Well, we, we 
we talked just to speak on that a little yeah. bit so we talked a little bit we talked about the playground equipment how that sort of seems to be an oversight uh, for a long time furniture was also kind of the oversight yeah. so okay. um, it, yeah. you'd get to the end of the project and if there was money left over you would maybe have enough to do a couple classrooms and you know you want and we've we've just learned as we've designed these spaces how critically important the furniture is to make making the school and the spaces successful so we really go out of our way to make sure that that budget is is in the project it doesn't get touched by the construction and that way at the end of the project and so some you know similarly maybe there should be a point four on that slide that these will be you know fully furnished as well you know again that's really important to making them function correctly Absolutely. Yeah. The, the other thing I think it's important to remember in terms of the taxpayer impact is that um, right around the turn of the last century, there were citizens in Oshkosh who paid money out of their paycheck to build Merrill Middle School. Mm -hmm. And those people who paid that money back then, I'm sure it was just as steep mm -hmm. for them to pay that at that time. And, and what an amazing story if they knew we'd still be using that building 120 <laughs> years later. And having a conversation of how do we, how do we take that legacy for another chunk of time? Probably, I wouldn't recommend 120 years, but how do we, how do we take that legacy and extend it? Because there were people who came before us who are not here anymore, mm -hmm. who paid a, a lot of money in their dollars out of their discretionary dollars to put the 20 buildings that we currently have in place, and I think most of them are probably not here, but they can rest easy knowing we've used every ounce of those facilities. And, then some. and I just was noticing in the 1950 decades, we built, or the citizens yeah. of Ashers built five schools five, right. yeah. in the 50s. Yeah. The Wisconsin Association of School Boards will be celebrating its 100th anniversary next year, and they've asked districts from throughout the state to supply them with pictures of old, what they call old schools. <laughs> When I told them we are using <laughs> schools in this district, it brought the conversation to a halt. But what I should have added was we have many people to thank for the condition of our buildings, yes. which we are still well, using, yes. and which are not only safe, but are excellent learning environments. But the message was that many school districts do not have schools of this age. I mean, we talked about that they're better learning environments when they're larger schools, but it's also cost efficiency too. I mean, have running all of those small schools is just not cost effective. Yeah. I mean, so when you consolidate the schools, you're also going to save some costs. Yeah. Now, the oh. district at that time mm -hmm. can decide to reallocate those resources to improve the schools you have, but you, right. you are going to get some efficiencies because you are not running um, 20 schools. Mm -hmm. Smaller. Simple things like yeah, garbage no. collection, you'll, you know, right. or yeah. utilities and. Um, mm -hmm. The whole laundry list of things you'll save by not having to do that at all those different right less and impact then when we talk about the benefits of consolidation um, is it fair to say that you know if we if these middle schools for example my daughter wanted to take French mm -hmm. and they don't offer it at South Park probably because there aren't enough kids that are interested in it or oh, no that's definitely the reason okay and so would it be fair to say that we could maybe bring back some languages to our middle schools when we consolidate and that would be a big benefit that well. that is one of the the actual benefits um, so when dr. Herzog was saying that there's 10 kids here 10 kids there so for example there's 10 students maybe over at Webster middle school that's interested in some foreign language right um, and same, then there's 10 other students maybe over at Merrill mm -hmm. Middle that have an interest in that same language. Mm -hmm. Currently, we will not offer that language mm -hmm. because there's not enough students to justify, to justify a right. teacher Can or a position yeah. um, in order to provide those services. Mm -hmm. Combined together, now you're getting to that threshold of maybe we should offer a section if we can find a right. teacher bilingual maybe all, speaks multiple languages yeah. um, to be able to teach that one language <clears throat> so ideally you would want to that's just an example but it happens in so many other fields as exactly. well you, you, when you're looking at your arts programs when you're taking a look at your world language programs when you're looking at your technology pro, your, your tech programs mm -hmm. it impacts so many areas of opportunity for our, for our children 
And that's why I asked because I think when we talk about this plan and consolidation, um, that there's so many benefits that we need to make sure that we communicate to our parents and students and teachers. It's gonna be, it's a great thing for us. We can offer more programs, we can save money. So, um, you know, I just challenge all of us to talk about this is gonna be a fantastic thing and share Dave's enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. So, share the pictures too. And share the pictures. <laughs> the pictures are <laughs> gonna have lots of pictures. That's what I said, those pictures are very compelling. I think mm -hmm. that that's, um, that is an easy oh, avenue to make people look at it differently too. Mm -hmm. You know that if you show those pictures that this is what we could have, like that's not like a, this is a dream. Like some of this can happen. No, those are real schools. I mean that just blows my mind. In that. Wisconsin, like you said, mm -hmm. like and those are Wisconsin, schools yeah. and districts yeah. around us, like North Fond du Lac. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've not heard from our <laughs> high school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you guys like, like to weigh in on this, or if you're still. Um, in awe of everything you've seen tonight, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to share if you so desire. I liked the pictures a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Those yeah. were very interesting. And, um, traveling to different high schools and like other schools for sports events and all of that, um, I can say like we definitely are on the lower end mm -hmm. of high schools and like not saying that our learning or anything right. is right. It's like the that. facility. Yeah, yeah, the facility is yeah. what is holding us back, I guess you can say, but the learning is just so amazing at all of our schools right. and yeah. for people to come here and maybe be turned away by like what the image of our district is and it's kind of sad because we have so much to offer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well said. Thank you. Absolutely. Very well said. I just think that like the pictures can be very persuading, mm -hmm. and um, to those families who might be hesitant to kind of be in favor of this idea, but yeah, I think it could, it's just kind of surprising to me that like schools in Wisconsin look like that, yeah. and like knowing that it's a pretty close district, like I never knew that. So I think that would be so cool just to like. Like in a couple more years, I could see that that's possibly Oshkosh. I just think that'd be so amazing. Thank you. It's good. It's always good to hear your voices and your weighing in on, mm -hmm. on these things. Are there any other comments or questions at this time? Awesome. <coughs> well, I thank you for being here tonight and all of you contributing to this presentation and we'll look forward to this coming back I believe in two weeks is that correct yes ma'am okay thank you again thank, thank, thank you guys all right our next agenda item is <coughs> is a request for future agenda items does anyone have any items they'd like to see on an upcoming agenda are there any announcements Don't forget the spaghetti dinner tomorrow night at North High, <laughs> 5 to 7. And uh, the North musical performance at the Grand, um, February 13th through 16th. And if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, you might, that might be a good idea. <laughs> Any other announcements? All right, we will adjourn then to executive session. One, considering the disciplinary data of specific persons under section 19.85, uh, paren 1, paren F of Wisconsin statutes. A, review expulsion recommendation from an expulsion hearing officer for a high school student who engaged in conduct while at school all, or while under the supervision of a school authority which endangered the property, health, or safety of others and endangered the property, health, or safety of any employee or school board member of the school district in which this, the pupil is enrolled under a section 120.13 paren 1 paren C paren E of Wisconsin statutes. D, deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business wherever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session under Wisconsin statute 19.85 paren 1 paren E. A, Oshkosh Education Association, OEA, negotiation strategies. B, Oshkosh Paraprofessional Employee Association, OPEA, negotiation strategies. 
C, non-teaching employee association, NTEA, negotiation strategies. And D, purchase of property. So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Carlin. Aye. Carlin. Aye. Evans. Aye. Evans. Aye. Garner. Aye. Garner. Aye. Herzog. Aye. Herzog. Aye. Hunstead. Aye. Hunstead. Aye. Pistol. Salaji. Aye. Salaji. Aye. Motion carried. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>